A man takes a long road trip with his family and stops at a random gas station. As he walks past the payphone, it rings. He answers, it's for him. An airman becomes a prisoner of war in Vietnam. While he endures six years of harsh captivity, a 16-year-old cheerleader prays for him every night. 40 years later, their paths cross in a 55,000-seat baseball stadium. According to best-selling author Squire Rushnell, these aren't mere coincidences, but divine appointments. He calls them God wings. Well, hey, good morning, Messiah. It's good to be here with you today. Uh, as you know, most of you probably know, you know, Pastor Jim is out this week celebrating the birth of his daughter, Alora. And so if you want to pray for them this week, uh, you can pray for Jim and for April and for Alora. And, and we're just so grateful here uh, for a healthy birth for those two. A cool little backstory, actually, with Jim and I. Uh, Jim was born and raised in Texas. I wasn't. But Jim actually taught night classes at Concordia University in Austin, which is where I went to school uh, to get my undergrad. And, and we never met each other when we were there, uh, but I did meet him, obviously, when he started working here at Messiah. And so, you know, we connect and we talk about Texas. And um, let me just say, uh, I love Texas. I loved going to school in Texas. I thought it was a great state. Uh, but people from Texas, do we have any people here from Texas? Okay. <laughs> People from Texas, they take a little while to get used to. Because people from Texas love Texas. They love being from Texas. They love talking about Texas. When they leave, they want to get back to Texas as quickly as possible. If you grew up watching SpongeBob, there's this character on there called Sandy Cheeks, okay, who sings songs about Texas. This is what people were like, okay? I thought this was meant to be a joke. It's reality, all right? So people from Texas love them from Texas, and it took me a little while to get used to. Uh, myself, I'm from North Carolina, uh, which I think is a pretty awesome state. I think we've got some cool stuff going on there. But I didn't quite have the same level of pride until I moved to Texas. And when you're surrounded by that much Texas pride, my contrarian nature came out and wanted to start showing off a bit of my North Carolina pride. And so I bought all these shirts with like North Carolina state flags on them. I bought little stickers that I put on my laptop that said, you know, North Carolina on them. Um, and so that was kind of the way I lived for, for about a year, my first year there at Concordia. And then one day, uh, I'm walking through by the dorms, and I see this guy wearing a shirt, and it says Outer Banks, North Carolina on it. And so, of course, I go over to him, and I say, hey, you know, nice shirt. How's it going? And I, I meet this guy. His name's Patrick. And Patrick was from Houston. And he grew up going to camp in North Carolina. He went there every year uh, growing up, and he still goes there all the time. And he just loves the state and wanted to talk to me about it. And so that was a cool little connection. We talked for a bit. I said goodbye, and I went on with my day. The next time I saw Patrick, I was not really in a chatty mood. I was not in a conversational mood. But guess who was in a conversational mood? Okay, Patrick. And he wanted to talk to me about North Carolina stuff. But me, you know, I had my own plans. I had the things that I was trying to get done that day. I was going off trying to do my own things, and here this guy comes trying to interrupt me. And I don't like being interrupted when I got my own plans, okay? And so here I'm stuck in this conversation with a guy, and I'm trying to get out of it as quickly as possible without looking rude. Have you been there before? I know you have. In conversations like this, right, this is when we start saying a lot of, uh-huh, 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 yeah, Maybe we throw out the word wow every now and again to make it sound like we're really listening to them. I stubbed my toe last week. Oh, wow, wow. Um, but we're just trying to get away as quick as possible. So I get it. So I'm in this place. I'm trying to leave the conversation, but I'm also trying to be courteous to this freshman guy. And so I stay and I, I talk for a little bit. And these moments with Patrick happen again and again until eventually, actually, Patrick and I became friends. And during those conversations, I found out uh, that Patrick was an atheist, which made him my, my first good friend at Concordia who didn't know Jesus. And it all started because of a t-shirt and a few inconvenient interruptions. We've been talking in this series about Godwinks, about these moments uh, that the rest of the world would call coincidence, 
but that we would call divine moments, part of God's divine plan. And, and, and uh, these moments, they can happen anywhere. They can happen at a, at a restaurant. They can happen at a grocery store. They can happen at a baseball game like we heard in that opening story. Um, and my dad, it's interesting, he's actually a long-haul truck driver. And he'll tell me these stories about people he meets out on the road. And one story I hear over and over again is about uh, these people he'll meet. Maybe he'll talk to them or, or maybe he just sees them across the room and he'll just feel compelled to want to bless this stranger and pay for their meal. Well, those moments, right, those random moments where my dad feels compelled to be generous towards a stranger, that's a God wink. And me happening to, to meet someone because of a t-shirt they were wearing on a particular day, to me, that's a God wink too. And those subsequent moments when I was interrupted and the moments when I didn't want to be interrupted, those were God winks. And I'm so glad that God could use a t-shirt and a few interruptions to introduce me to someone who didn't know him. Maybe you've heard before uh, that, that God can use your pursuits for his purposes. Maybe you've heard something like that before. Uh, we all have our own pursuits. We're all pursuing our own careers. We've all got our own hobbies, our own passions. And we've heard maybe that, that God can use those things for his kingdom. And that is 100% true. God does use your career and your hobbies and your passions for his kingdom. But what's interesting is that God also likes interrupting those same pursuits for his kingdom too. And I think those are the moments that I find a little bit more difficult. Because I like it when God works in my schedule the way that I want him to. And I don't think I'm alone in that. Right, we're all, a lot of us here are faithful people, and we probably think, yeah, God, you can use me for whatever you want, whenever you want, as long as it's not when I'm at work. And also not when I get home from work, because, you know, I'm trying to take a break from the day. And honestly, God, if you could not use me on Saturdays, right, that's college football, I've got some things going on, right, I like letting my sinful side come out a little bit on Saturday, so don't use me then either. But any other time, God, specifically between 4 and 6 p.m., maybe on Wednesdays, Use me whenever you want. That's the kind of attitude, you know, I, I've had that attitude in my life. And I don't think I'm alone in that. But I wonder sometimes, what do we miss out on when we get so caught up in the predictable and the normal moments, the predictable and the ordinary moments, and we close ourselves off from the unpredictable but the extraordinary moments? There, there are stories in Scripture over and over again about people being interrupted by God to be used for his purposes. And we're going to look at one of those stories today. And it comes to, it comes to us from the book of Acts. Um, to give you some context, the book of Acts was written in the immediate aftermath, or written about the immediate aftermath of the church. Right after Jesus' was death, his death and resurrection, the book of Acts tells us what happens to the church after that. And so this is when you start seeing uh, the apostles, guys like Peter and John, start preaching the good news. And, and they start off by preaching that good news in Jerusalem and in, in the areas around Jerusalem. And here we start seeing the church grow. We start seeing people come to God, and we start seeing the church living in a beautiful communal way. This is when you start to see the church you know, sharing their possessions, sharing their money, worshiping and praying together every day. And so we get early on this beautiful image of what this early church looks like. And then this guy, Stephen, comes along, and Stephen says some things that the Jews in Jerusalem didn't like. And so what do you do with someone you don't like? You take him outside of town and you stone him to death, right? And so that's what the Jews did to Stephen. And in the aftermath of Stephen, they've decided, you know what? We have had enough of these Christians, and we see the start of the first large-scale persecution against the church. And this persecution is so bad, it sends most of the Christians out of Jerusalem running away to find new places to live. Now, we hear that story and we think, you know, what a bad story. Persecution, being chased from your homes. We see this as a bad thing, but Acts 8 wants us to see it differently. Here's what happens in the aftermath of that scattering. The believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. 
crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims, and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. So what people meant for evil, God used for good. God takes this persecution and this scattering and uses it as an opportunity to spread the gospel and transform lives. And here we meet for the first time a guy named Philip. Philip was not one of the original 12 disciples, but he does have the distinct honor of being the first person to bring the gospel to a non-Jewish foreign people. Now, Samaria, this was this region just north of Judea. So if you're picturing a map, you've got Judea in the south, Samaria to the north, and it's right in between another Jewish area called Galilee. That's where Jesus was from. And the people in Samaria at one time, they would have been considered Jewish, but they married a bunch of people who weren't Jewish. They started introducing new worship practices to the community, and the Jewish people didn't like this, and they began seeing uh, the Samaritans as second-class people people who were less than them. In fact, this division was so strong that if a Jew was trying to get from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, they would go around Samaria rather than go through it and have to interact with the people there. Okay, so that's the level of division we've got going on. But Philip is sent to this community. And unlike in other moments, right, other moments in Acts, you'll see the gospel enter a community and it's met with a lot of resistance or it's met with a lot of skepticism. When Philip goes to Samaria, all we see is that the gospel is received with eagerness and with joy. And I look at Philip's story here, and I think, man, Philip is living a pastor's dream right now, okay? To be able to go to a foreign city to preach the gospel and to have it be received with eagerness, I mean, that's what all pastors want. That's what Pastor Chuck wants. That's the kind of ministry I want, for the word to be received with eagerness, And I'd say, in fact, that this is the kind of success that we would want in any business or in any job, right? Business owners, they want eager customers. Nonprofit owners, they want eager donors. Teachers, how badly do you want eager students, okay? We all want to feel like wherever we're sent to is eager for what we have to offer. And so professionally speaking, Philip's in a great place right now. And spiritually speaking, we know that he's doing all of this through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so professionally and spiritually, Philip is in the sweet spot. And I love the sweet spot. And it's right here in this sweet spot of success that God comes in and interrupts Philip. The story goes on. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. Now, Scripture kind of points this out, right? Uh, But we got to talk about how weird of a situation this is, how weird it is for God to send Philip to Gaza. You see, Samaria is kind of this urban area. I mean, things are happening there. Gaza, though, Gaza is this watering hole on the edge of the map. You'd go to it right before you'd hit the desert on your way to Egypt. Right? So you got a picture here, the picture you should have in your mind if you've seen one of those movies maybe where someone takes a road trip out west or maybe you've gone out west and you see one of those signs that says last gas for 100 miles. I mean, this is where God sends Philip to. Hey, I see your great success in Samaria. You're doing this great church plant. Why don't you go to a gas station out in the middle of the desert? That's where I'm going to send you. And what did God send Philip to Gaza for. By the way, no explanation. All God says is go to this place in the middle of nowhere, and that's it. And what did God send him to that place for? The story goes on. There is an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He'd come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah, And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So God interrupts Philip in his place of success, in his sweet spot, to go after one person. And if you ask me, this sounds absolutely crazy. 
At the very least, it sounds inefficient. I mean, God, you're going to send the guy with the successful urban ministry and take him away to the middle of nowhere? I mean, couldn't you send someone else to do that? Someone with a little less prestige, a little less going on? If I were Philip, I think, God, is this really what you want to do? Is this really what you want to interrupt me for? I mean, you really want to take me out of this sweet spot of success. You really want to take me away from Samaria and send me there to the middle of nowhere? You want to do all that for one person and ruin this great thing that I've got going on here? But Philip does it. What's crazy is that God called him to do it. What's even crazier is that Philip says yes and follows through. All he had to do was trust God with this call and trust that God knew what, knew what he was doing when Philip didn't understand it himself. Think about for a second if you were Philip. If you were Philip and you were in this place of success and you were in this sweet spot, if God were to interrupt you then, well, that's not good for your brand, is it? That's not good for, for climbing the company ladder and, and using your position of influence in the company. No, we've been taught here that moments of success are meant to be used for our benefit. I'm supposed to use my moment of success for me. Success is what I use. I leverage it to then move up. And God sees Philip's success and calls him to move down. God sees Philip doing a big thing and calls him into a place of doing a small thing. And Philip says yes. Philip does it. And when he walks over to the Ethiopian eunuch, here's what happens next. Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask, does your prophet say this? about himself or about someone else. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. So we could see this story as God interrupting someone at an inconvenient time. We could even see this story as God ruining someone's moment of success and preventing them from climbing that ladder of success. Or we could see this another way. What we could see here is a story about a guy named Philip, who is the very first recorded person to have success bringing the gospel to a non-Jewish people group, bringing the gospel to a foreign people. And God sees what this guy is doing. He sees this guy's experience, and this guy with this background and this experience is then sent to go bring that gospel to another non-Jewish person. And when I start looking at it like that, I think, well, of course God would use Philip for this great calling. Of course God would interrupt Philip, whose pursuits led him to bring the gospel to a different nation and use him to bring that gospel to another person from another nation. But I think that more important than Philip's experience is Philip's faithfulness. This moment only happened because Philip wasn't faithful to his success, he was faithful to God. His mission wasn't to glorify himself, his mission was to glorify God. You see, if Philip if his mission had been about his own glory and his own success, he would have never left Samaria. He would have never gone out of that sweet spot and followed God's call to the middle of nowhere. But Philip was faithful to God's call over his own success. And now, there's a church in East Africa that traces their origins 
all the way back to this story that we read here in Acts chapter 8. God knows what he's doing when he interrupts us. And in God's eyes, the one is just as important as the many. The small is just as important as the big. I know we've got a lot of successful people here. And I know that we are busy with our own pursuits. We're busy with our own habits. And it feels like we don't have time for other people, other things. And I know that when that person from your office comes to talk to you or when your neighbor comes over to want to chat to you, it always feels like it's at an inconvenient time, right? It always comes at a moment when we don't want to talk to them. But what Acts tells us is that God's interruptions can do, God can do more with his interruptions than we ever could do with our successes. Your neighbor doesn't need your salary or your office position, but your neighbor needs your presence in their life. And God cares just as much for the one as he does for the many. You see, this story of Philip being interrupted to meet the Ethiopian, it reminds me of one of my favorite teachings of Jesus. Jesus compared the love of God to a lot of things during his ministry, and one of the things he compared it to was the love of a shepherd. And from Jesus, we get this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. In the same way, is not my heavenly Father's will, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. Messiah, do you realize that that story is about you? Because you had your moments when you doubted God, when you wanted to walk away from him. You had your moments when you thought you were done with him, but you're here today because God wasn't done with you. Could you imagine in that moment if when you wanted to walk from him, God looked at his church and said, you know what, I got plenty of people here, right? Messiah's a pretty big church. I don't gotta worry about one or two walking away. No, no, no. That's not what God did for you. No, God did whatever it took to bring you back into the family. He interrupted and sent whoever it took to bring you back home again. God loves interrupting people to bring his lost sheep back home. He even interrupted Jesus. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was praying in the garden and he didn't want to be interrupted. Now, Jesus' prayer was one of desperation, saying, God, if you could do anything but this, please do it. Because Jesus knew that that interruption was going to be an arrest and his death. But then he prayed, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And that interruption was the interruption that we all needed to bring all of us lost sheep back home again. And I think about all the people in my life who God interrupted and sent after me so that I would be here today. I think about all of our leaders here at Messiah whose lives are interrupted on Sunday mornings, Sunday evenings, and Wednesday evenings so that you can bring the gospel to our young people here at our church. I see you. Hannah sees you when you allow yourself to be interrupted for our young people. And I bet you can look back and remember the people whose lives were interrupted and who God sent after you. You see, God doesn't just wink at you. God runs after you and he chases you and he won't let you go until you're back home with him again. That kind of love is not efficient. That kind of love doesn't make sense, but man, that love is good. God left the 99 to go after the one. So I want to finish my story from earlier about Patrick. 
Remember how I said he interrupted me in all those moments uh, when I didn't want to talk to him? Well, it turns out uh, Patrick uh, had gotten to become friends with all of my other friends at Concordia, and we were all hanging out one day a few months later, and we all found out that we'd all gotten to know this guy named Patrick, and thankfully we had a Pentecostal friend in the group who's just a little more tuned to the Holy Spirit than the rest of us. And he said, I think God wants us to reach Patrick. I think God wants to use us to reach Patrick. And that's when I recognized the God wink. I didn't see it that day I met him uh, and he was wearing that shirt. I didn't see him in those moments of interruptions. I'm a bit slow sometimes. I take a while to get back to you on things. I'm sorry if you've sent me an email recently. Um, I could be a bit slow with things, but it was in that moment that I realized this was the God wink. And so over the next couple years, man, I remember, okay, I would get into my, my Bible and I'd get certain scriptures to prepare for when I talk to Patrick. And I'd, I'd prepare certain questions to ask of him. And by the way, those things never really worked out the way I planned, okay? When you invite someone over to watch football, it turns out they just want to watch football and not talk about Jesus. Um, <laughs> so I prepared all these things. They never went the way I wanted to, but and Patrick stayed a part of our lives, and we all invited him over to hang out. We invited him to parties. We even invited him to pray with us sometimes when he was around us. And that's how that went for about two years. And then I get home from work one day, and I walk into my apartment, and I see six men hanging out on my back balcony, which back then wasn't a weird thing, but now it would be. But I see six people hanging out on my back balcony, and I go out there, and I see my roommates, my friends, and I see... Patrick's standing there in the middle of them. And he shares with me that he'd come over that night because the night before he had fallen on his knees and prayed to Jesus that he would be saved. And he said that over the past two years, through his friendship with all of us and his friendship with people on our campus who knew Jesus, he knew what he was missing. He knew that it was Jesus who he needed in his life, who he'd rejected for so long. And eight months later, you know, you think that's good enough. Eight months later when I'm on my internship in Virginia and I'm wondering what God's going to call me to next, I get a text from Patrick that says, got baptized. In my old apartment pool, he got baptized. I look at that text and I think, thank God for interrupting me in the moments that I didn't want to be interrupted. God left the 99 to go after Patrick. And God left the 99 to go after you. And now that we have all been found by the good shepherd who came and found us, now we are called to then go and find other lost sheep just like ourselves. We have this value here at Messiah, a value that says found people find people. And by the way, that's a value that speaks about all of you because all of you, me included, Pastor Chuck included, all of us were lost and were found. And now that we've been found, there is no more exciting honor than getting to be a part of finding other people. And it's all because God left the 99 and came after you. Amen.